I'm so glad that you've tuned in to one of the sermons from St Mary's. If you're new to our church and would like to find out more about being involved, please visit our website and drop us a line. We'd love to hear from you. When they heard these things, they became enraged and ground their teeth at Stephen. But filled with the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they covered their ears And with a loud shout, all rushed together against him. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord Do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he died. And Saul approved of their killing him. That day, a severe persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout the countryside of Judea and Samaria. Devout men buried buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church by entering house after house, dragging off both men and women. He committed them to prison. Now those who were scattered went from place to place, proclaiming the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaim the Messiah to them. The crowds with one accord listened eagerly to what was said by Philip, hearing and seeing the signs that he did. For unclean spirits crying with loud shrieks came out of many who were possessed and many others who were paralyzed or lame were cured. So there was great joy in that city. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, help us to hear your word and to act on it in Jesus' name. Amen. I wonder if you thought we'd gone slightly mad. As Gemma's already said, those weren't the usual uh, Pentecost readings. Where's that amazing, joyful story about how they were all together in one place and they heard that violent wind and saw the tongues of fire? Where's that long list of all the visitors to Jerusalem who heard the good news of Jesus in their own language? Where's that amazing sermon from Peter filled with the Holy Spirit? Pentecost is a day to celebrate. But after those readings, it looks a bit as if we're looking at a tragedy. And the breaking up of the Christian church and the beginning of Saul's persecution of the, all the Christians he could find. But was it a tragedy? Or was it all part of God's amazing plan? Did God use it in amazing ways? And how does it fit into our sermon series, which looks at what the early church was devoted to? They certainly weren't devoted to the kind of cruelty that Stephen experienced, even if they may have expected some of it, if they'd really heard what Jesus said in that Matthew reading. The series began by thinking about the paradox of how the church changed and is changing and how some things don't change. We looked at how the disciples were devoted to prayer, to signs and wonders, to praying, to being united, and last week to sharing. Do you remember Gemma's plate of spinach? I love spinach, so I can have hers if you'll have my beetroot, which I hate. 
So what is the church devoted to in this reading, the readings today? Let's look first at Stephen himself. If we go back to chapter six, we find he was one of the seven chosen because they were known to be full of wisdom and the Holy Spirit. And their job was to make sure that the widows who were Greeks were not treated unfairly and differently from the Hebrew widows because resources had not been shared fairly. But Stephen wasn't just a wise sharer of practical resources. He was full of grace and power and did all sorts of signs and wonders. And he then got the backs up of the officials from the synagogue of the freed men, also known as the synagogue of the libertines. It's thought that that was a synagogue that catered for those Jews who'd been slaves to the Romans, who'd returned to Jerusalem when they were freed. Some of them probably from various places in North Africa and parts of Asia. So they were probably delighted to be back in Jerusalem and to get back to some of the traditions that they were familiar with. They tried discussing with Stephen, but it was more like arguing. And they just couldn't win against his wisdom. That sounds a bit familiar, doesn't it? When Jesus was challenged about what he was saying and doing, he so often turned it back on people. And often the opponents just disappeared. But in the end, they thought they'd won as he was falsely accused, crucified. But then came the resurrection. False witnesses were produced against Stephen too. They stirred up the people to believe that he'd been blasphemous in what he'd said about Moses and about God. They said that he declared that worship of God was not restricted to the temple. Now, we'd certainly agree with that, wouldn't we? But they twisted his words to suggest that Jesus was saying that Jesus would destroy the temple. And in doing that, he'd overthrow the law. That's what they accused Jesus of, too. And as Jesus spoke with that, as Stephen spoke with that great passion, the people heard him and they saw the face of an angel. He was obviously radiant in his faith and love of Jesus. The high priest asked him whether the accusations were true and he rehearsed their history in a sermon that was highly significant in the development of the church's theology. He reviewed the history, making it clear that the church's mission was universal and changing, not static, not just local, not unchanging. He made it very clear to them that God's presence cannot be localized and that people have always rebelled against God's will and purpose. Abraham moved and didn't inherit the land promised to him. Joseph went to Egypt as a result of his brother's jealousy. Moses was rejected by his brothers, but he brought the people out of Israel. The people built a golden calf, rebelling against God, and they complained throughout their journey. And this pattern continued through the Babylonian exile when they sought visible gods and some turned to Baal. But God isn't stuck in one place. He can be worshipped anywhere at any time. But the people had continually rebelled against God's plan for them. Even when God had so often sent prophets and teachers to tell them about his mercy and his compassion. But in the end, they betrayed and murdered their Messiah. And they carried on in the ways and traditions of their ancestors. Stephen reminds them that the tabernacle that they built in the desert and the temple in Jerusalem localized God. They try to restrict him. But as Stephen says, God doesn't dwell in houses made by man. The Jewish religion had become static and unchanging. And that was not God's plan. So we can understand, I think, why the synagogue officials were furious. Stephen was challenging their long-held beliefs. God wasn't limited to Israel. He wasn't to be worshipped in the temple, only in the temple. But Stephen barely notices the crowds of angry people. He looks up to heaven and asks them if they couldn't see God in all his glory with Jesus standing right beside him. The Message Bible says the mob went wild 
a rioting mob of catcalls and whistles and invective, and dragged him off to stone him to death. But Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit, and he asked that Jesus would take his life. And then, as Jesus had done on the cross, asked that the people responsible for his death would be forgiven. His suffering and his death were worth it to be with the Lord he loved. He celebrated his own death. But it's difficult for us to celebrate such cruelty, even if it does show very clearly the impact of the Holy Spirit on Stephen himself. And he was deeply mourned as they buried his broken body. But then what happens? A fanatical young man had watched Stephen being stoned. He'd actually looked after the clothing of those who were hurling the stones. He supported the executioners in their beliefs, and he began to persecute as many Christians as he could find. He wanted to crush this sect, which seemed to attract such a faithful following. He organized house-to-house -house searches and dragged the Christians off to prison. He was quite sure that they were horribly wrong about what they believed about the God that he knew and he had worshipped all his life. They fled. In all directions, they fled to escape. That might have been a tragedy too, but it was actually good news for us. We should be celebrating that the church began to spread across Judea and Samaria. The good news of Jesus probably spread far faster than it would have done otherwise. And we hear how Philip went and proclaimed the message about Jesus, performed miracles, healed people, drove out evil spirits, so that there was celebration and joy. And the good news was carried far and wide as they became missionaries to new communities. The knowledge of Jesus was spreading because the of the influence of the Holy Spirit. That takes us back to the devotion of the early church. As a result of the apparent tragedy of Stephen's death, the church grew. The church became devoted to going where God was sending them, and therefore, to growing. So there is much to celebrate. The tragedy of the crucifixion led to resurrection. The ascension led to the coming of the Holy Spirit and to Peter's message being heard by people from all over the place. And now Stephen's death and the persecution of the people who followed Jesus led to the gospel spread even further. And that pattern of change continues to repeat itself as it did throughout the Old Testament. And it continues to change as God's purposes are worked out. And that can be a challenge to us as we face change, which may not always be comfortable. And sometimes we're called as individuals to step out of our comfort zones, away from doing things the way we always have to go into places and situations that God wants us to go, to go so that the church can grow. And just as that applies to us as individuals, it applies to us as a church who needs to go and grow together, knowing what God's purpose is. Yes, we can see those patterns today as we re re reflect on how, without the pandemic, 